to recap, in Q1, we navigated several unforeseen challenges as well as the ramp of the updated Model 3 in Fremont. There was, as, as people have seen, the EV adoption rate globally is under pressure and, and a lot of uh, other water manufacturers are pulling back on EVs and pursuing plug-in hybrids instead. We believe this is not the right strategy and electric vehicles will ultimately dominate the market. Despite these challenges, the Tesla team did a great job executing in a tough environment and uh, energy storage deployments, a mega pack in particular, reached an all-time high in Q1, leading to record profitability for the energy business. And that looks likely to continue to increase in the quarters and years ahead. It will increase. We actually know that it will be significantly faster than the car business, uh, as we expected. We also continue to expand our AI training capacity in Q1, more than doubling our training compute uh, sequentially. In terms of the new product roadmap, there's been a lot of talk about our upcoming vehicle line in the next in the past several weeks. We've updated our future vehicle lineup to accelerate the launch of new models ahead of previously mentioned startup production in the second half of, of so we expect it to be more like the early 2025, if not late this year. These new vehicles, including more affordable models, will use aspects of the next generation platform as well as aspects of our current platforms and will be able to be produced on the same manufacturing lines as our current vehicle lineup. But it's not contingent on any new factory or massive new production line. It'll be made on our current production lines much more efficiently. And, and we think this should allow us to get to over 3 million vehicles of, of capacity when realized to the full extent. Regarding FSD version 12, which is the pure AI based self-driving. People that, if you haven't experienced this, I strongly urge you to try it out. It's profound and the rate of improvement is rapid. We've, and we've now turned that on for all cars with the cameras and inference computer and everything from hardware three on in North America. So it's been pushed out to I think around 1.8 million vehicles and we're seeing about half of people use it so far and that percentage is increasing with each passing week. So we now have over 300 billion miles that have been driven with FSD V12. Since the launch of full self-driving, supervised full self-driving, it's become very clear that the vision-based approach with end-to-end -end neural networks is the right solution for scalable autonomy. It's really how humans drive. Our entire road network is designed for biological neural nets and eyes. So naturally, cameras and digital neural nets are the solution to our current road system. To make it more accessible, we've reduced the subscription price to $99 a month, so it's easy to try out. And as we've announced, we'll be showcasing our purpose-built robo-taxi or cyber cab in August. Yeah. Regarding, regarding AI compute, over the past few months, we've been actively working on expanding Tesla's core AI infrastructure. For a while there, we were training constrained in our progress. We are, at this point, no longer training constrained, and so we're making rapid progress. We've installed and commissioned, meaning they're actually working, uh, 35,000 H100 computers or GPUs. Or GPU is the wrong word. They need a new word. <laughs> <laughs> I always feel like a wince when I say GPU because it's not GPU, that's G stands for graphics and doesn't do graphics. But anyway, roughly 35 H100s are active, and we expect that to be probably 85,000 or thereabouts by the end of this year in training, just for training. We are making sure that we're being as efficient as possible in our training. It's not just about the number of H100s, but how efficiently they're used. So in conclusion, we're super excited about our autonomy roadmap. I think it should be obvious to anyone who's driving a version 12 in a Tesla that it is only a matter of time before we exceed the reliability of humans and not much time at that. And, and the, the, we're really headed for an electric vehicle and autonomous future. And I'll go back to something I said several years ago, that in the future, gasoline cars that are not autonomous will be like riding a horse and using a flip boat. And that will become very obvious in, in hindsight. We continue to make the necessary investments that will drive growth and profits for Tesla in the future. And I wanted to thank the Tesla team for incredible execution to, during this period and look forward to everything that we have planned ahead. So what is the current status of Optimus? We are able to do simple factory tasks, or at least I should say factory tasks in the lab. The In terms of actually, we do think we will have Optimus in limited production in the factory, in the actual factory itself, doing useful tasks before the end of this year. And I think we, we may be able to sell it externally by the end of next year. These are just guesses. As I've said before, I think Optimus will be more valuable than everything else combined. Uh, if you've got a, a sentient humanoid robot that is able to navigate reality and do tasks at, at request, there is no meaningful limit to the size of the economy. So that's what's going to happen. And I think Tesla is best positioned of any humanoid robot maker to be able to reach volume production with efficient inference on the 
robot itself. The, this perhaps is a point that is worth emphasizing. Tesla's inference efficiency is vastly better than anyone, any other company. There's no company even close to the inference efficiency of Tesla. We've had to do that because we were constrained by the inference hardware in the car. We'd never choice, but that, that will pay dividends in many ways. What is Tesla's current assessment of the pathway towards regulatory approval for unsupervised FSD in the US? It's actually been pretty helpful that other autonomous car companies have been cutting a path through the regulatory jungle. But the, which is that's actually quite helpful. And they, they have obviously been operating in San Francisco for a while. I think they got approval for City of LA. So these approvals are happening rapidly. I, I think if you've got at scale it's just a statistically significant amount of data that shows conclusively that the autonomous car has, let's say, half the accident rate of a human driven car, I think that's difficult to ignore because at that point, stopping autonomy means killing people. So I, I actually do not think that there will be significant regulatory barriers provided there is conclusive data that the autonomous car is safer than a human-driven car. And in my view, this will be much like elevators. Elevators used to be operated by a guy with a relay switch, but sometimes that guy would get tired or drunk or just make a mistake and share somebody in half between floors. So now we just have, we just get in an elevator and press a button. We don't think about it. In fact, it's weird if somebody's standing there with a relay switch. That'll be how cars work. You just summon a car using your phone, you get in, it takes you to your destination, you get out. You don't even think about it, just like an elevator. It takes you to, to your floor, that's it. Don't think about how the elevator is working or anything like that. And, and something I should clarify is that Tesla will be operating the fleet. So you can think of like how Tesla, think of Tesla as some combination of Airbnb and Uber, meaning that there'll be some number of cars that Tesla owns itself and operates in the fleet. There'll be some number of cars and there'll be a bunch of cars where they're owned by the end user, but that end user can add or subtract their car to the fleet whenever they want. And they can decide if they want to only let the car be used by friends and family or only by five-star users or by anyone, at any time, they could have the car come back to them and be exclusively theirs, like an Airbnb. You could rent out your guest room or not anytime you want. As our fleet grows, we have 7 million cars going to, 9 million cars going to, eventually tens of millions of cars worldwide with, with, with a constant feedback loop every time something goes wrong, that gets added to the training data and you get this training flywheel happening in the same way that Google search has the sort of flywheel. It's very difficult to compete with Google because people are constantly doing searches and clicking and, and Google's getting that feedback loop. It's the same with Tesla, but at, at a, a scale that is maybe difficult to comprehend, but ultimately be tens of millions. I, I think there's also some potential here for an AWS element down the road where if we've got very powerful inference, because we've got a hardware three in the cars, but now all cars are being made with hardware four, Hardware 5 is pretty much designed and should be in cars, hopefully towards the end of next year. And there's a potential to have for the to run when the car is not moving to, to actually run distributed inference like AWS, but, but distributed inference like it takes a lot of computers to train an AI model, but many orders of magnitude less compute to run it. So if you can imagine the future paths where there's a fleet of 100 million Teslas and on average, they've got like maybe a kilowatt of inference compute, that's 100 gigawatts of inference compute distributed all around the world. It's pretty hard to put together 100 gigawatts of AI compute. And even in an autonomous future where the, the car is perhaps used, instead of being used 10 hours a week, is used 50 hours a week, it still leaves over 100 hours a week where the car burns computer could be doing something else. And it seems like it would be a waste not to use it. We, we do have some insight into how good the th things will be in like, let's say three or four months, because we have advanced models that are far more capable than what is in the car, but have some issues with them that we need to to fix. So they're like, there'll be, there'll be a step change improvement in the capabilities of the car but it'll have some quirks that are that need to be addressed in order to release it. As Ashok was saying, we have to be very careful in what we release to the fleet or to, to customers in general. So if we look at say 12.4 and 12.5, which are really could arguably even be version 13, version 14, because it's pretty close to a total retrain of the neural nets and in each case are substantially different. So we have good insight into where, where the models, where, where how the car, how well the car will perform in say three or four months. Can we get an official announcement of the timeline for the twenty-five thousand dollar vehicle? Really, the, the way to think of Tesla is almost entirely in terms of solving autonomy uh, and being able to turn on that autonomy for a gigantic fleet. And I think it, it might be the biggest asset value appreciation in history when that day happens, when you can do unsupervised full self-driving. Have any 
of the legacy automakers contacted Tesla about possibly licensing FSD in the future? We're in conversations with one major automaker regarding licensing FSD. Can we make FSD transfer per permanent until FSD is fully delivered with level five autonomy? No. I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on kind of the new vehicles. I think we've settled we will on that front. So what's your follow-up? Maybe you can just talk about where your heart is at. Tesla constitutes the majority of my uh, work time, and I work pretty much every day of the week. It's rare for me to take uh, a Sunday afternoon off. Make sure Tesla is very prosperous, and it is like it is prosperous, and it will be very much so in the future. What's your team's degree of competence on growth above zero percent? No, I think we will have higher sales this year than last year. How long would it take your best Chinese competitors to copy a cheaper and better vehicle that you could offer a couple of years from now? I don't know what our competitors could do, except we've done relatively better than they have. With you know, if you look at the drop in our competitors in China's sales versus our drop in sales, our drop is less than theirs. So we're doing well. But I think Kathy would said it best, like really, we should be thought of as an AI or robotics company. If you value Tesla as a, just like a, an auto company, you would just have to fundamentally, it's just the wrong framework. And it will come to, if you ask the wrong question, then the right answer is impossible. So, I mean, if somebody doesn't believe Tesla is going to solve autonomy, I, I think they should not be an investor in the company. Like that is, but we will, and we are. And then you, you have a car that goes from 10 hours of use a week, like an hour and a half a day, to probably 50, but it costs the same. If you've not tried the FSD 12.3, and like I said, 12.4 is gonna be significantly better and 12.5 even better than that, and we have visibility into those things, then you really don't understand what's going on. It's not possible. We're putting the actual auto in automobile. Tell us about future horse carriages you're making. I'm like, actually, it doesn't need a horse. That's the whole point. That's really the whole point. You've spoken about your desire to obtain 25% voting control of the company. I think no matter what, Tesla, even if I get kidnapped by aliens tomorrow, Tesla will solve autonomy, maybe a little slower, but it would solve autonomy for vehicles at least. I don't know if it would win on with respect to Optimus or with respect to future products, but it would that there's enough momentum for Tesla to solve autonomy, even if I disappeared for vehicles. Now, there's okay. a whole range of things we can do in the future. Beyond that, I'd be more reticent with respect to Optimus. If we have a super sentient humanoid robot that can follow you indoors and that you can't escape, we're talking Terminator level risk, then yeah, I'd be uncomfortable with if there's not some meaningful level of influence over how that is deployed. And if those shareholders have an opportunity to ratify or re-ratify the sort of competition. I guess I can't say that. But that is a fact. They have an opportunity. Okay. Uh, Very good. And uh, yeah, we'll see. If the company generates a lot of positive cash flow, we could obviously buy back shares. What are the types of activities that you're presumably sacrificing as a result of parting ways with these folks? We're not giving up anything that is significant that I'm aware of. We've, we've just had a long period of prosperity from 2019 to now. And so if a company organizationally is 5% wrong per year, that accumulates to 25, 30% of inefficiency. We've made some corrections along the way, but it is time to reorganize the company for the next phase of growth. And you really need to reorganize it just like a, a human when you, we start off with one cell and kind of zygote and blastocyst and when you start growing arms and legs and briefly you have a tail. And But you shed the tail. You shed the tail, hopefully. And then you're a baby. And you basically, you have to be the organism. A company is a creature growing. And if you don't reorganize it for different phases of growth, it, it will fail. You can't have the same organizational structure if you're 10 cells versus 100 versus a million versus a billion versus a trillion, where humans are like around 35 trillion cells. It doesn't feel like it feels like one person, but you're, you're basically a walking cell colony of roughly 35 trillion, depending on your body mass, and about three times that number in bacteria. Anyway, you, you've, you've got to reorganize the company for a new phase of growth, or it will fail to achieve that growth. Can you elaborate on how much the licensing business opportunity you mentioned today has progressed? I think we just need to, it just needs to be obvious that our approach is the right approach. And I think it is, I think we're now with 12.3, if you just have the car drive you around, it is obvious that our solution with a relatively low cost inference computer and standard cameras can achieve self-driving. No LIDARs, no radars, no ultrasonics, nothing. Just no heavy integration work for vehicle manufacturers. Yeah, it's a, so it would really just be a case of having them use the same cameras and inference computer and licensing out software.
And but it's once it becomes obvious that if you don't have this in a car, nobody wants your car. It, it's a smart car. And I just remember, like, the back when there was King of the Hill. Yeah, cell phone. Yeah, crushing. I saw them come out with a smartphone that was basically a brick with limited functionality. And then the iPhone and Android. But people still did not understand that all the phones are going to be that way. There's not going to be any flip phone. Like, there'll be a niche product. Or home phone. Yeah, not even. Exactly. When was the last time you saw a home phone? And people don't understand all cars will need to be smart cars. Or, they, or you will not sell this, the car will not, nobody will buy it. Once that becomes obvious, I think licensing becomes not optional. License it or nobody will buy your car. A, a deal signed now would result in it being in a car in probably three years. That's like lightning, basically. I, I wouldn't be surprised if we do sign a deal. I think we have a good chance we do sign a deal this year, maybe more than one. But yeah, it would, it would be probably three years before it's integrated with a car, even though all you need is cameras and our inference computer. So it's like not a massive design change. Do you still see meaningful incremental price reductions as making sense from here for the existing products? Yeah, I think we can be free cash flow positive meaningfully. At the end of the day, like for any given company, if you sell a great product at a great price, the sale, if you have a great product at a great price, the sales will be excellent. Mm -hmm. That's true of any arena. Over time, we do need to keep making sure that we're that it's a great product at a great price, and moreover, that price is accessible to people. So it's not, you have to solve both the value for money and the fundamental affordability question. The fundamental affordability question is sometimes overlooked. Somebody's earning hundred, several hundred thousand dollars a year, they, they don't think of a car from a fundamental affordability standpoint, but for the vast majority of people are living paycheck to paycheck. So it actually makes difference if the cost per month for lease or financing is $10 one way or the other. It's important to keep improving the affordability and to keep it's just like making the price more accessible yeah the, the, exactly make the price more accessible the value for money better and to keep improving that over time but also to make kick-ass coach that people want to buy yeah it's yeah. got to be a great product at a great price and the standards for what constitutes a great product at a great price keep increasing so there's you, you can't just be static you have to keep saying keep making the car better improving the price but improving the cost of production and that's what we're doing can you please help us understand maybe some of the timing of launching fsd in additional geographies including maybe clarifying your recent comment about china like new markets yeah we, we are a bunch of markets where we don't currently sell cars that we should be selling cars in. We'll see some acceleration of that. So the thing about the all the end-to-end the -end neural net based autonomy is that just like a human, it actually works pretty well without modification in almost any market. So we plan on with the approval of the regulators, releasing it as a supervised autonomy system in any market that will, that where we can get regulatory approval for that, which we think includes China. So yeah, it's just like a human. You can go rent a car in, in a foreign country and you can drive pretty well. Obviously, if you are if you live in that country, you'll drive better. And so we will make the car drive better in these other countries with country-specific training, but it can drive quite well almost everywhere. It understands that it shouldn't hit things no matter where it was. <laughs> Whether or not you feel that supply constraints that you mentioned throughout the release impacted the results. And maybe can you help us quantify that? And is that why you have some confidence in net growth in 2024? If, if you've got cars that are sitting on ships, they obviously cannot be delivered to people. And if you've got the excess demand for one, for Model 3 or Model Y in one market, but you don't have it there. It's like, it's a quite a logistic, it's, it's an extremely complex logistics situation. So, you know, and I'd say also the, we did overcomplicate the sales process, which we've just in the past week or so have greatly simplified. So the, it was, it became far too complex to buy a Tesla, whereas it should just be, you can buy the car in under a minute. So we're getting back to the, you can buy a Tesla in under a minute interface from what was uh, quite complex. In your comments around distributed inference, can you talk about what that approach is unlocking beyond what's happening in the vehicle right now? That's why I think it's analogous to Amazon Web Services, where people didn't expect that AWS would be the most valuable part of Amazon when it started out as a bookstore. So that was on nobody's radar. But they found that they had excess compute because the compute needs would spike to extreme levels for brief periods of the year, and then they had idle compute for the rest of the year. So then what should they do with all that excess compute for the rest of the year? That's Don't monetize it. Yeah, monetize it. So it seems like a no-brainer to say, okay, if we've got millions and then tens of millions of vehicles out there where the computers are idle most of the time, that we might as well have them do something useful. Yeah, exactly. And then the, if you get to the 100 million vehicle level, which I think we will at some point get to, then, and you've got a kilowatt of usable compute, and maybe you're on hardware, six or seven by that time, then you really, I think you'd, you'd have on the order of 100 gigawatts of usable compute, which might be more than anyone, more than any company, probably more than any company.
like technically like Apple would have the most amount of distributed compute, but you can't use it because it, you can't get the, you, you can't just run the phone at full power and drain the battery. Yep. So the, whereas for the car, even if you're a kilowatt level inference computer, which is crazy power compared to a phone, if you've got a, after your 60 kilowatt hour pack, it's still not a big deal to run. So run. If you're plugged in. With, whether you're plugged in or not, plugged in or not plugged in, you, you could run for 10 hours and use 10 kilowatt hours of your kilowatt of compute. Correct. Yeah. We're together so, built-in liquid cold thermal management. Yeah, that's it's exactly. That's for data centers. So it's already there in the car. Exactly. So yeah. it's distributed power generation. It's just distributed access to power and distributed cooling, and it's already paid for. Looking at the, the 4680 ramp, can you talk about how close you are to target yields and when you might start to accelerate? We, we're making good progress on that, but I, I don't think it's super important for at least the near term. As, as Laura said, we think it will be exceed the competitiveness of suppliers by the end of this year, and then we will continue to improve it. The big part of the 4680, or Tesla doing internal sales, was a hedge against how, how what would happen with our suppliers. Because for a while there, it was very difficult because every big car maker put in massive battery orders. And so the prices, the price per kilowatt hour of, of, battery, of lithium ion batteries went to crazy numbers, to crazy levels. Bonkers. Just bonkers. Okay, we've got to have some hedge here to deal with the cost per kilowatt hours numbers that were double what we anticipated. If we have an internal cell production, then we have that hedge against demand shocks you know, with too much demand. So that's really the way to think about it. So it's not like we want to take on a whole bunch of problems that just for the hell of it. We, we, we did the cell program in order to address the, the crazy increase in cost per kilowatt hour from our suppliers due to gigantic orders placed by every car maker on earth. And once again, we'd just like to strongly recommend that anyone who is thinking about the Tesla stock should really drive FSD 12.3. You really, you, you, you can't, it's impossible to understand the company if you do not do this. You mentioned that auto cogs per unit for the next gen vehicle would decline by 50% versus the current three and Y. On the topic of 4680 cells, I, I know you, you mentioned it, you really thought of it more as like a hedge against against rising battery costs from other OEMs. What seems to be happening is that the, unless I'm missing something, the orders for batteries from other automakers have declined dramatically. So we're seeing much more competitive prices for cells from our suppliers, dramatically more competitive than in the past. It is clear that a lot of our suppliers have excess capacity. Yeah, now this is going to wax and wane, obviously. There's going to be a boom and bust in, in battery cell production, you know, where production exceeds supply, and then supply exceeds production, and back and forth on a DRAM or something. But it's like what is true today will not be true in the, in the future. There's going to be somewhat of a boom and bust cycle here. And then there are additional complications by with government incentives, like the, the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRS. I always found like a funny name for a comical name. Yeah. This is it like the Irish Republican Army, the Internet Research Agency from Russia. Independent Retirement Group. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Roth IRA has a poor Spider-Man situation, which I which IRA wins. It does complicate the incentive structure so that there's there there is perhaps a stronger demand for cells that are produced in the US than outside the US. But then how long does that the IRA I don't know.